Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. It is well known fact by now that most diseases are caused due to dysregulation of pathways or networks and they are not caused just because of effect of a single gene. It could be just in very few rare cases, but otherwise it is a group of genes or proteins or a pathway is actually going to affect a given disease. Hence, it is important to understand how proteins interact with each other. In today's lecture, Dr. Bing Jiang will introduce you to the concept of network analysis and various tools available for its use. I hope this information will be very helpful for your own projects when you are looking at how proteins interact with other protein and form a given network. So, let us welcome Dr. Bing Jiang for today's lecture. So, um, in this lecture, we are going to talk about um, biological network analysis. So, uh, I think we had plenty of science and formulas and things like that. So, I will start this lecture with a poem. Uh, actually, it was a very beautiful poem from a, um, um, a poet John Dundee. And uh, this was written, I mean, uh, 400 years ago. Um, it's titled, No Man is an Island. And I don't want to repeat this, but it's a very beautiful piece of work and basically express the idea that in uh, the holistic view of the society, so no man can survive or thrive without the support from the community. Um, so, I think it's still true, although 400 years has passed, it's still true in today's society. And um, you can think about I mean, people around you, for example, through connections um, with uh, WhatsApp. Uh, I think that's the one you guys use in India. Uh, you have a connection through that social network, right? And uh, so, a few years ago, when I was reading a review article in this Nature Review um, Genetics um, from the Albert Barbasi, um, and uh, so basically, this sentence reminded me about this poem. And uh, the idea is that if uh, there is a change in a gene in the network, it will have the impact not only to the gene itself, but the impact will pass through the whole network. So, I, I, I was thinking, okay, so it's not only no man is an island. Actually, no gene is an island. So, that's the thing we're going to talk about uh, today. So, I mean, we need to understand uh, biology understands the genes in the context of the networks. So, indeed, during the past decade also, I, um, a lot of studies have shown that uh, complex phenotypes, including most of the disease phenotypes, are the result of the dysregulation of the networks rather than individual genes. Like network dysregulation causes disease, not individual gene causes disease. And in order to understand the network, I will first introduce two terms. One is called node and the vertex or vertex. So, those are basically the individual elements uh, in the network and uh, they are connected by edges. So, with these two terms, then we can look at some typical biological networks um, we have. Um, they can be divided into two categories, the physical interaction networks. So, these are the types of networks, the nodes are connected to genes or proteins that physically interact with each other. Uh, for example, the protein-protein interaction network and in this network each node is a protein and the edge represents the interaction between two proteins. And the signaling networks and it is a kind of a spe uh, specific type of protein-protein interaction network and it is not only the interaction of the proteins, but the protein A can kind of regulate protein B, right. For example, a kinase as we just talked about, kinase uh, could regulate the downstream target. So, in this way you can imagine a network like this, but the edges are directed. For example, this is a kinase, this is a target. This is called undirected net protein-protein interaction network, but it, in signaling networks it is uh, this uh, protein has a, can modify the other protein. So, there is a direction, uh, direction uh, associated with the edge. And also the gene co uh, regulatory networks, uh, in these networks the nodes are the, uh, either the transcription factors or it can also be the microRNAs 
and they'll target genes. It also a directed network, so it represents the inter physical interaction between the TFs or microRNAs and their targets. And the metabolic networks, uh, in this one, the loads are the metabolites, and the edges are the reaction going from the substrate to the product. Also, it's a directed network. Uh, and uh, another type of network is called functional association networks. In this type of network, I, um, we don't really know whether the two genes in the network interact with each other or not. They may or may not interact with each other. For example, the co-expression network, if we, we have uh, an, a lot of experiments, and we always see two genes keep going up and down together. We can infer the co-expression relationship between them, and that can actually be um, quantified, for example, based on the Pearson coordination. And uh, in this way, I mean, this we can also call this a weighted network, meaning the edges can be weighted by the co-expression level, right? Uh, and uh, it's also undirected. And the genetic network, I mean, are the net, uh, nodes are the genes, and the, um, the relationship indicates the genetic interaction, meaning you do some perturbation experiment. If you knock out gene A or gene B, you get the same phenotype, then you can uh, guess maybe there's some uh, relationship between the genes. So, the first question I want to talk about is how we get all those networks. Because we talk about the network, we need to get the network first in order to do something on them, right? So, first we talk about the protein protein interaction network. And uh, in order to get protein protein interaction networks, basically we want to establish the relationships or interaction relationship between two proteins. Uh, as you can see here, right? So, the experimental approach that can help us to get this type of relationship, uh, including the East 2 hybrid experiment or the uh, pull down experiment, uh, uh, pull down followed by the mass spec analysis. Uh, and uh, there are also computational approaches uh, that can help us infer the protein protein interaction relationships. For example, we can uh, start from the known protein protein interactions and then we can. Uh, try to infer, I mean, which domains actually interact with each other, and then we can generalize to new p protein pairs. If they have those interacting domains, we can guess maybe they interact with each other. And then we can, there are a lot of studies in the model organisms. We can also, uh, through the ortholog relationship, we can also map those to human, and then, for example, guess the interaction relationship in human. And uh, we can also do phylogenetic profiling, so meaning and you have a lot of proteins uh, in each organism, right? And then you look at the existence, whether this protein exists in organism A and B or et cetera, right? And then after you do this for a lot of hundreds of organisms, you will be able to see some proteins tend to uh, co-occur together. For example, in this map, uh, in this table, I'm can you tell me which two proteins are more likely to be interact with each other than the other proteins, pairs? Is it B and uh, C? B and C. A. Yeah, exactly. A and C because uh, always um, appear together, right? So if you need two proteins to interact, they have to coexist in that organism in order to eat, uh, interact. And similarly, and through the gene expression or protein expression experiments, we, if we see two proteins uh, always come up together, and then we can infer the uh, interaction relationship. But of course, those are uh, all computational approaches just help us to make inference needs to be validated. Um, yeah, and another way is, I mean, you don't want to do experiments and you don't know how to do the computational inference, but the, there are plenty of protein-protein interaction uh, databases that you can use to download those information. And here I list uh, in, um, quite a few I mean, um, databases that you can, I don't want to go through them individually, but uh, it's in the handout and then you can get those, uh, get to know those resources by yourself after the class. And for the protein DNA interaction, um, so basically we want to establish the relationship between the transcription factors and the target genes. And the experimental approach includes the chip, uh, chip, which is the early version of the uh, study. Now it's people are usually doing chip seek. 
um, and the computational approach and we can do some promote sequence analysis uh, through the motif analysis uh, or we can do reverse engineering from MRI profiling data um, and also there are databases that we can get this type of information from the transpec. I think this is now commercialized um, but the Jasper is the open source resource that you can use. And the metabolic networks, those are the networks that have been very well studied for a long time and the very well established database for this type of networks and the two commonly used ones include the CAG and the Metasig, uh, these are two well used uh, metabolic network uh, or pathway databases. Um, and for the co-expression network which is also typically used, I mean this is mostly from the computational analysis. You start with the gene expression or protein expression matrix. Uh, each row is a gene, each column is a sample. And then you can use uh, one of these methods to do co-expression network inference. Uh, for example, the WGCNA, uh, what you do is to you calculate for each pair of genes, you calculate the co-expression relationship and then for example through the Pearson coordination and then you get a score and you get a weighted network. Uh, and then what they did was to raise the uh, uh, coordination to a certain power to further discriminate the inter, uh, highly correlated ones from the lowly correlated ones. And the net same package we developed, I mean, so basically try to uh, convert this weighted network into some unweighted networks because there are certain graph algorithms that we can use, uh, can apply to the uh, unweighted network but cannot easily apply to the weighted network. In this case, I mean we can think about a k nearest neighbor approach. Uh, so basically for each of the nodes in the network, we can ask what are the, uh, I mean let's say we are talking about a, a two nearest neighbor network and we are asking in this network what are my two best friends and then we get for each gene we vote for the two best friends for each gene. And then when you think someone is your best friend, the other guy may not think the same, right? And then we also remove those relationships. We only keep the ones that are mutual. I mean you think I'm your best two friends and you also think so. So basically this can give you uh, from this network to a very robust relationship with the, but it's unweighted network now. So Arachne is also another very popular tool to use to build a co-expression network. Rather than using Pearson coordination or Spearman coordination uh, that uh, deriving the relationship between two genes based on mutual information. So that is also a good idea because I mean, uh, it, um, the mutual information can capture different types of relationships, not only the linear relationship or monotonic relationship. Uh, there are more types of relationships that can be captured by the mutual information. So let's say you went, uh, go through all this and then you were able to build a network, right? This was what happened like uh, maybe uh, in early 2000. Uh, there are a lot of experiments that have been done and the people start to build the protein-protein interaction networks in from the early time for the yeast and then um, also the human protein-protein interaction networks through experiments have been published. Um, at the very beginning people get very excited, oh this looks great and, uh, and uh, we get a lot of information but uh, then if you look at this, I mean, uh, people start to realize these are just hairballs, right? I mean it's beautiful to look in a way but what can we do gain from this? So then the next question is if you have the network, what can you learn from the network? Um, and in order to do that, maybe I will uh, introduce a few more terms in order to uh, um, better understand these networks. The first is the degree. Uh, the degree means the number of links or edges each node has. Uh, for example, we can look at uh, this um, node, this uh, uh, purple node in this network and basically it has three links and uh, it has degree of three. This is for undirected network. But if it's within a direct network, each node have incoming degrees and also outcoming degrees. And for example, this uh, MHR, MHR, uh, this uh, gene, it has out degree of one, two, three, but in degree is one. So degree is a very simple but important measurement for the nodes or genes in the network. Uh, because if you look at this, you would think this uh, is 
kind of in the more center position of the network if it has higher degree right. So, this it is a very uh, simple uh, indication of the centrality of each node in the network. And the second thing we want to talk about is a path. So, that is how we start to explore the relationship between two nodes in the network right. For any uh, pair of nodes you pick and you can find paths that link these two nodes. For example, here and we can find this paths which include two edges and then we can also go 1, 2, 3 here or we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here right. So, that a lot of different paths that you can find in your network and the one with the shortest the total length of a path uh, for example, from this node to this node and I think uh, this a path with two uh, links is the shortest path this is called the short path between them. So, um, with the understanding of the degree and the path then we can start to explore some of the property of these networks. I think the after we get a network the first thing we want to do is to understand and the how the network is organized what are the uh, characteristics um, we can learn from those networks. Um, the first one um, I want to yeah the first property we want to talk about. So, maybe I will give uh, show you this example I mean these are two networks each of them have um, 130 nodes and 215 edges. So, the number of nodes and edges are the same, but if you look at these two networks uh, they are not very uh, they are actually quite different right. So, one thing is that I mean, this network is more homogeneous meaning every node is very similar to each other. So, basically they have the same number of connections um, the five red nodes basically uh, with the highest number of links only reach 27 percent of the other nodes. But if you look at here I and mean, the nodes are very heterogeneous meaning some of them have a lot of links, but most of them only have one or two links. Um, so, uh, in this network the five red nodes with the highest links uh, that they can reach 60 percent of the uh, other nodes in the network. So, this is I mean, uh, that means the nodes are very similar in this network and the nodes are not similar in this network. And in reality most of the uh, real life networks like social networks or the bio even biological networks they usually have this organization rather than this one. And the Parabasi and who is the uh, kind of uh, um, very important person in uh, network analysis. Um, he named this network scale free network and this is basically a random network if you randomly connecting nodes this is what you get, but the real life network are not like this they are more like this this is called the scale free network. Uh, so, this can be probably best uh, understood in social networks and we can immediately understand what are the hubs in the network right. Of course, those are the people that are celebrities like the stars and uh, for example, if you look at the social network they of course, have a lot of connections and uh, for us guys I mean maybe we do not know too much too many people and they only have a few connections. So, the hubs are the celebrities in the social network, but biological networks are also have this scale free organization. So, of course, and people interesting to know I mean what are the hubs in the biological networks do they play a different role in the uh, biological processes than the other nodes in the network. So, in early 2000 like 2001 there were uh, was an interesting study. So, at that time um, uh, there were a uh, um, uh, genetic study in yeast uh, basically try to uh, delete each individual protein in the yeast proteome and try to see the impact of those proteins uh, deletion of those proteins and they found some of these red proteins. Uh, has a uh, lethal impact meaning if you delete that protein the cell will die and some of them are I mean does not cause much impact uh, or some of them uh, uh, only cause slow gro uh, growth. But at that year I think the protein uh, interaction network of the yeast have also been published. So, uh, this group try to combine these two types of data and say and now uh, I group the uh, nodes in the network in based on the number of links or edges or degree they have in the network and uh, here is uh, nodes with only one link and here is a node with uh, 20 links. So, basically you group them based on the number of links and then they look at the 
percentage of the nodes in that category uh, that has a lethal impact after when, delete, uh, when the protein is deleted. And you can see a very nice uh, positive correlation between the number of links of a node and the percentage of the uh, lethal proteins in that category. That means the hub proteins meaning the nodes that have more connections in the network when it is deleted it will have a stronger impact to the uh, cell itself. And uh, during uh, after that publication and people keep exploring what are the other possible properties of the hubs in the uh, biological networks and uh, in this review article by Mark Wedel uh, in 2011 and he summarized the major findings. So, basically the first study showed the hubs correspond to the essential genes and they tend to be older proteins and uh, usually they evolve more slowly than other proteins in the network. Um, they have tendency to be more abundant uh, and they have a larger diversity of uh, phenotypic outcome when it is deleted. Uh, they could have different types of uh, functional that means they may be involved in more different types of functions. So, and uh, then um, you may wonder why um, the, uh, the cells choose to establish or the evolution has um, I mean evolved into this scale free network rather than a random network right. Uh, does this give the cell any benefits and uh, indeed if we think about I mean, a network like this and uh, if it is a scale free network. Let us say the mutations we know that the mutations or random attacks uh, on genes right. Um, but if the mutations occur randomly across the genome it could hit, hit any of the proteins. But most of the proteins are the proteins only with one or two links. So, uh, like um, mutation in these proteins will not affect the uh, cell as a system right. So, it provides the cell the robustness to survive. So, meaning uh, mutations typically do not have a uh, important consequence because it does not make significant uh, impact to the network as a system. But this also gives us some um, uh, we can also think it this way. Now, if we want to try, try to kill bacteria in the cell and what should we do? And in that way we can think about the uh, targeted uh, 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 attack of the central node meaning the hubs for example, in the bacteria network because if we attack this important nodes then it will destroy the bacteria. I mean that is one way we can think about how to prioritize genes when we want to treat a disease we may try to kill fungi or kill bacteria in a uh, human. Um, that is the first uh, property of the network is the um, existence of hubs or the scale free uh, property of the network. The next thing I want to talk about the, the small world network. Um, so, uh, this was um, originally uh, studied by the in the social network context by a, so, uh, um, uh, uh, a scientist called Stan, uh, Stanley Milgram. Uh, I think he was a, a social scientist in Harvard and he did this experiment in 1967. So, the, the idea is he want to understand how people in the uh, 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 are connected right to each other. Of course, uh, now it is easy because we have the internet and since we know how to do this, but at that time I mean it is actually very difficult to do this. How can you even think about I mean to a way to uh, estimate or to understand how people are connected to each other. I think he come up with a very interesting experimental design. So, he prepared the 160 packages and he gave those packages to random people in a very small city Omaha uh, Nebraska in the US uh, and then he gave these packages to a um, random person in this small city and they asked them to try to send the package to a stock broker in Boston which is far away from Omaha right. And then you cannot directly send this to him because you do not know him you have to every time you have to pass this to somebody you know. Uh, this is his instruction. So, and then at the end uh, he uh, got collected all the letters from this uh, stock broker and then he counted how many times is required for the letter to reach um, the, the stock broker from the original place. 
and surprisingly, I, um, the average uh, number of passes to reach him was six. So that is a famous six degree of separation. I think probably some of you have heard about of this phrase came from uh, from his study. And uh, then um, through this study, he understand well. Although it looks like everyone is so far away from each other, especially when you think about it, it was in 1967, right? And maybe nobody knows each other. But now you see, uh, well, for any um, person, you don't really have a good connection, and still you can reach him in six uh, steps. Um, and uh, so this is what he calls the small world network. And if we look at the biological networks, it's also in the average uh, pass length between any two nodes. I mean, it's um, between like three to four. Uh, actually, it's even smaller than the uh, social network he estimated at that time. Um, I think one reason with uh, the I mean, uh, it's, uh, biological networks use a small network structure is probably because it can pass the information more efficiently. And the next property uh, I want to talk about is the motifs. Um, so when we talk about motifs, it's a patterns that keep occurring in a system uh, more often than random chance, right? Um, so if we think about uh, three loads in, uh, uh, I mean, what are the possible relationship between them? There are actually 13 different types of relationship between three loads if they have, are somehow connected. Uh, and then, uh, for example, uh, this pattern is very well studied. It's like the for, uh, fade forward loop, right? Node A can um, uh, have a uh, positive relationship with this node B, and then it also through node C, it also has A, C, B, right? So there is a, uh, it's called the fade forward loop, and this is called a feedback loop. So basically, it go around. Um, and then for each of these, maybe let's say this is a real network, and then you can count all the uh, how many times you see a fade forward loop, the three node motif in this small network, and then you want to know whether this is a motif. I mean, uh, the, because the definition is statistically more frequent than random chance, right? What you can do is to randomly shuffle the loads in this network and build some random networks. Uh, and then you can, after you do the shuffling, you can count the number of the fade uh, forward motifs again. And then, for example, here we see a lot more fade forward motifs in this network than the random networks. And uh, um, the, uh, there is a study in uh, E. coli, a transcriptional regulatory network, uh, because uh, in Engineering, we know that the feed forward loop and the feedback loop both are very commonly used, I mean, to regulate a system, right? Uh, but in the biological network, like the transcriptional network, they actually found that uh, the feed forward loop, uh, they uh, observed 42 in the E. coli network, but uh, they only uh, didn't observe any feedback loop in that network. And this is significantly more than what you would expect by chance. So that means this is. Uh, um, or kind of a motif or the way of organizing the nodes that the biological system actually use, but not the, uh, uh, I mean, the faithful, uh, uh, feedback loop. Uh, and the next one is the modularity. Um, so this basically says, I mean, uh, the genes and the, or proteins in the network tend to form groups um, uh, rather than randomly connected to each other. Um, and uh, so in the transcriptional uh, networks, I mean, these are, of course, uh, in transcriptional modules, meaning the target genes, of course, I mean, they are, if they are targeted by the same set of uh, transcription factors, they form a group, right? And in the protein, protein interaction network, like this one, we can see I mean, the, these are uh, the groups of proteins in the network, and these are usually the uh, protein complexes, um, um, in the network. Uh, and the signaling networks, uh, we can have the signaling pathways that uh, um, uh, represent the modules in those networks. And also, the modules are not only in, um, occurred like, uh, separately, they are also organized in a hierarchical way, meaning uh, the small modules that uh, get connected to each other to form a relatively larger modules and then eventually uh, reach the whole network. 
and we can think about the protein complexes and the two complexes may interact with, with each other to form a, 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 a relatively larger um, network and uh, eventually um, we know the six degree separation right everything is actually connected. Um, so, those are the um, uh, five different properties associated with network that I have been reviewed through a lot of studies. In today's lecture, you were introduced to various types of protein 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 DNA and other biomolecular network analysis. These interactions can be either experimentally determined or through the use of computational software predictions. Databases like DIP, Mint, BioGrid, they contain information of various protein protein interactions. Metabolic networks can be studied using databases like KEG or Metasic while co-expression networks can be computationally determined. PSR correlation coefficient is a direct indicator of lethality and connectivity. It is important to note that biological networks generally follow the characteristics of small world networks. I hope this information is giving you more clues and ideas how you can utilize these available resources and do more protein protein and protein biomolecular interaction and network analysis for your own data set. In the next lecture, we will learn more about the visualization of network and Dr. Bing Jiang will continue his lecture and show you how to use various tools to do data visualization for network analysis. Thank you.